Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. I'm a PhD student in, Nor in economics at Northwestern University, and today I'll be discussing the, in the linkages between anthropos and economic, and economic geography. This is a joint project with Hugh Mondog. So the fundamental question that motivates our project is what explains the distribution of economic activities across space? Why are cities located where they are, and why is the dist distribution of cities so uneven? A large empirical literature has explored this question and emphasized the significance of transportation infrastructure in determining allocation of production and consumption across space, the spatial allocation of co consumption and production. Less attention and less explore is the role of trade intermediation. The act of shipping goods from location to location requires a substantial amount of local labor and local resources. We could think about, for example, 1860, Employment by railroad companies alone accounted for 10% of total workforce in Chicago. The, and the, the, this costly interchange and transshipment of goods, which we, we consider to be kind of entrepot like services, is that it's services that, are, that, that help facilitate trade, could actually have a direct economic impact where they, to where they occur. They could generate a substantial economic stimulus and spur economic development. And that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, the, the topic of our paper, which will be exploring the welfare consequences and economic effects of this entrepot services. If you think about entrepots today, the empirical challenge is that entrepots tend to be locations that are prosperous for other, for other reasons. If we think about entrepots today, there are places with, such as Singapore and Hong Kong, where there are also large financial hubs and large financial sectors. So it's hard to disentangle the effect of entrepot from the effect of other locational amenities. As such, to solve this problem, we're going to look back into history and focus on a historical insight, which is that entrepots tend to form at junctions of transportations, uh, transportation networks. So essentially, when you could think about at the end of a river, it's, it's locations where entrepot services naturally arise because there needs to be labor in, 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 in taking the good from the, from the ship to land and onto other transportation services. So we, so we use this insight and looking historically, we're gonna, we're gonna study transportation discontinuities along the, 18, along the 19th century United States railroads induced by gauge breaks. So a basic fact about railroads is that trains run on tracks and the width of a track is referred to as a gauge. And while gauges are standardized today at four feet, eight and a half inches, they were not so in the 19th century where nine distinct ga gauge widths were used. And in locations where tracks of different gauges met, there was an incompatibility and requirement in, in that in there, was a, there was a costly essentially transshipment of, of freights from one train to another. And this generated a substantial economic stimulus at the locations where they occurred. So the point of our so the first part of our paper will be providing reduced form evidence that that show that these entrepot these gauge breaks had a causal impact on economic development where they occurred, and the second part of our paper will be incorporating this entrepot sector into a structural general equilibrium model of trade and geography that will allow us to kind of derive conditions for welfare as a function of these existence of these entrepots and evaluate kind of counterfactual meaning counterfactual counterfactuals meaningful counterfactuals in absence of these historical accidents. And I think it's interesting because we could very well imagine a version of US history where all railroad companies started out by choosing the same gauge and these gauge breaks never existed in the first place. So this paper is broadly re related to three strands of literature. It's related to this literature on kind of uh, quantitative trade models where we kind of, where the trade causes typically considered to be exogenous. It's just a parameter in the model, such as iceberg trade costs. And here are contributions that we're, sh we're showing a way for us to kind of endogenize trade costs by factoring the exact kind of labor required in the shipment of goods. It's also related to this large literature on railroads in the United States that goes back to at least Fogel, which looks at the effect of railroads on US development. And in that literature, where the, this is kind of the first paper that look at the, the positive effect of gauge breaks. Third is related to the literature on entrepots directly, and here I think the most similar paper to ours is Blakely and Lim paper in, from 2012 that look at portage sites of rivers. And our paper will be starting a more kind of, a, will be approaching the question with a more of a structural method. Here's a brief outline of the rest of the talk. I'll go into a little bit about the historical background. 
Then I'll present the data we use. Finally, I'll show the reduced form analysis. And then I'll quickly summarize kind of the structural model. So historical background, the overview we want to have is just in the 19th century, there was diversity of gauges in use in, 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 in the United States. And the location of gauge breaks required a kind of, um, required local services, local labor and services were required in the, in the facil facilitation of trade from one, of tracks of one gauge to another. So what is a gauge? Gauge simply refers to kind of the width of, of, a, of a railroad track. And you could think, and trains are designed to, be, to, to run on a specific gauge. So if a train is designed for a gauge of five feet, it cannot, you know, it, it, can, it can operate on a track of four feet, eight inches. So even very, very minute deviations in the width of a track really matters for the, for the compatibility of the trains. So why, are they, so why would not railroad companies not just all build on the, same, on the same gauge and choose one to begin with? For this, we should look at kind of the history of railroad development in the United States. So the railroad development in the United States was a very patchwork and decentralized process. Here we see initial kind of spurs of railroad development in 1840, and we see it's, it's, there's no national network. There's not a consolidated national network. Instead, we have bits and pieces of railroads all along, along different cities. You see there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's kind of a railroad hub in the, in the northeast. Then from Chicago, we have kind of a, a few kind of scattered miles of tracks. And in the south, from Atlanta, there's also railroad tracks. But these, these railroad companies, these private railroad companies were, were building railroads to kind of uh, monopolize trade in a local region, carrying goods from the, from the hinterlands to the, to the cities, to the coastal cities. So there was no real vision of national network. But as time went on, as more, more and more tracks were starting to be built, eventually kind of the, the railroad network became connected. And here's what it looks like in 1861. And finally, 1870, we have the Transcontinental Railroad and essentially a very dense network of railroads. So let us revisit the railroad network as it was in 1860. In some ways, this picture is very misleading because it gives the impression of a very consolidated, consolidated and coherent network. But if we color the, the railroad tracks by the gauges they were used, a very different picture emerges. Here we see there's actually kind of nine distinct gauge regions where a gauge region refers to kind of a, a network of tracks that run on the same gauge. And it was actually a, fa a, a, fa a fact in 1860, only 17% of railroad stations could be reached on common gauge. So gauge changes were very frequent. And you can see here, they occur at different points kind of in the interior of the United States. And gauge, and so is, you might be wondering, like, when do these gauge breaks go away? When do the differences go away? They start going, so we see from, from the period of 1850 to 18, 1875 was really the height of the diversity of gauges. And they start, and gauges start becoming standardized in a period after that. You know, when there's, extre there's a lot of consolidation in the ownership of railroads, and when one company purchases another company, the first thing they would tend to do is kind of pull out the tracks that other companies lay down and lay down new tracks of the same gauges as, as the ones you have to kind, of, um, to kind of capitalize on the externality and complementarity. And we see from 1870 onward, there starts to be a period where the gauge breaks disappear. So we'll be studying, we'll be studying the, railroad, uh, the railroad network as it was in 1860, and we'll be kind of looking at the locations where the gauge break happened, or which we identify through kind of ArcGIS, uh, through, kind of, um, through a spatial software, and the question essentially we have is, is what was the effect of, um, of these gauge breaks? And there's kind of extensive uh, narrative evidence from history that the gauge breaks were very costly. So in 1860, only, only, as I mentioned, only 17% of US railroad stations could be reached on common gauge. And at the location of a gauge break, labor would be required to either change the chassis of the trains or simply move the freights from one train to another. And this, this the cost amounted to about a quarter per ton, and the delay, the delay imposed by this process could be up to 24 hours. The Boston Board of Trade maintained in 1860 these gauge taxes on traffic between Boston and Chicago alone amounted to $500,000 in 1866 dollars. So that's quite a significant amount of, uh, quite a significant cost. And the benefit of the gauge breaks were really kind of internalized by people at the time. Here's a quote from a senator from Iowa who mentioned, you know, wherever there's a break in gauge, so there's a lot, always a large amount of business to be done, and towns sprung up immediately in place. 
And in fact, we have kind of evidence that, for example, even as late as 1870, Memphis lobbied to have a railroad of a different gauge built to the southern entrance of the city in order to, get, in order to kind of um, have a gauge break that's in the city and be able to kind of uh, benefit from it. So this was something that people at the time were considered to be really economically significant. In fact, when attempts were, ma were made by railroad companies to standardize gauges, this was often met with armed opposition. A famous example of this is, uh, is what happened in Erie, Pennsylvania, where a railroad company tried to standardize the gauge along the Erie, along the Erie Railroad, and the local town people actually kind of, uh, I guess, resisted by just you know, like, uh, refusing to let the railroad company standardize because they enjoyed having the amenity of a gauge break in place. And this led to kind of an armed conflict between the two groups. So here's a quick uh, summary of the data we'll be using in our, in our empirical analysis, which will be trying to test the hypothesis that the gauge breaks you know, have a causal impact on economic development locally. We get data on the historical transportation network from, uh, from, from Jeremy Atex data, which, at, which also contains information on rivers and canals, and as well as, as, well as the railroad network in 1860. And we, we we make, we make contribution to the data by kind of identifying the location of gauge breaks and, uh, and, and essentially plotting them. And we use, we use information um, on kind of uh, demographics and characteristics of locations at the county level from NHGIS, which has contains information about population as well as other attributes. So in the reduced form analysis, we'll be trying to answer three, uh, two questions. Were these entrepot locations actually more populous? Did, did they have more population than other comparable locations? And is the relationship causal? Did entrepots lead to increased population at these locations? And we'll try to answer the question with three kind of um, three uh, three complementary methods. First, we'll just show OLS regression of uh, population on entrepot status, as well as different as well as, well as um, distance from entrepots. Then we'll then to to establish identification, we'll introduce an instrumental variable strategy, which will rule out kind of the effect of selection or, or reverse causality. Lastly, we'll also show a difference in difference strategy, which will show the timing of population growth in these places really kind of uh, coincided with the introduction of gauge break, which kind of further, further strengthens our argument. So first, this is our kind of very basic uh, re uh, regression specification. On the left-hand side, which is the outcome, we have the locked population of a county in 1860. On the right-hand side, we have, first, the gauge break variable, which, is the, which will be the, uh, which beta is the coefficient of interest. And the gauge break uh, variable will be a measure of the proximity of the county to the nearest gauge break. The idea is that the closer the, gauge, the county is to the nearest gauge break, the more we're likely to benefit. We, we include extensive uh, vector of controls uh, some of which are time invariant, some of which are more kind of initial economic conditions. So we control the things that you think might matter as far as uh, population growth for the county. So, so we include a polynomial in the latitude and longitude of the county. Uh, we include a log area of the county. We include the distance to other geographic features that might be relevant, such as canals, lakes, waterways, coasts, as well as major cities. And in our vector of uh, socioeconomic controls, we include railroad growth, in 1850 and 1860, so whether a county has railroad, we include also the density of railroad companies. So you could think maybe the effect is driven by some counties have a lot more railroad companies than other counties, and that's what's really leading to the increased population. So to address, for, to address this, we just include the number of railroad companies in, enclosed in the county directly. We also include lack population growth to, to account for potential kind of a selection on, on, on population trends. We also in some specifications, include lack of manufacturing employment, age distribution, share of population white, gender ratio, and such, things that could possibly affect population growth. Here's a visual, here's just a visual representation of the regression results. Here, each, each, dotted, each dotted point is a, is a coefficient of a regression of this form. So it's, the, it's essentially a beta coefficient. It's a, it's, it's a value of beta from a, from a regression of this form where the, where the independent variable for the, where the coefficient is on is whether the county is located within x kilometers to a nearest gauge break where the x is identified on the x-axis. 
And essentially we see for counties that are located as, as, as close as kind of 25 kilometers away from a nearest gauge break, there's a significant kind of a population effect. And the effect kind of dissipates the further we get from a gauge break, which entirely kind of coincides with our intuition that this is kind of a very local effect. And what's interesting is that if we look at railroad employment in these counties, which we identify using census data, we also see these are exactly the counties where we have higher railroad employment, which completely makes sense because given our story, it's, it's, it's the need for railroad, railroad employment and kind of uh, railroad workers that's really driving the, the surplus demand for labor in these locations. And we see that the two effects are pretty much lie on top of each other. So is the relationship causal? I think there's, I think uh, the compelling kind of a story, uh, the compelling competing story you have probably have in mind is that because people realize the benefit of having an engaged break, towns maybe, or maybe counties with more political capital could lobby exactly for, for them to be installed in, in, in those towns. And the, the effect we're measuring is really reflecting kind of the effect of increased political capital as opposed to having the gauge break itself. So there's omitted variables and possible kind of reverse causality in place. So as such, we're going to try to uh, instrumental variable strategy, which is um, there's a common method to establish kind of a causal relationship in the field of economics. And um, so the intuition for our instrumental variable is going to, we're going to actually try to predict where gauge breaks will likely occur in absence of any manipulation. And how are we gonna do that is we're gonna look at the railroad network in 1840. And essentially we're gonna draw straight lines between railroad hubs of different gauges. So you imagine these railroad hubs as, let's revisit a map from a long time ago. So this is the railroad network in 1840. So we're gonna essentially draw straight lines between um, between lines of tracks that are of different gauge, and you can imagine if these railroad networks kind of uh, expanded concentrically and radially from, from their point of origin, the gauge breaks should occur somewhere in the middle of these straight lines. So we're gonna use distance away from the straight line as a, to predict whether a location will be a gauge break or not, and the exclusion restriction is that distance away from this, these midpoints have no effect on population other than the likelihood of being a gauge break, which we think is plausible since, you know, if you drew a bunch of, a bunch of lines on a map, you don't expect their midpoint to be very consequential for other reasons. Here's kind of a visualization of how we do the, of how we do the instrument. And, yeah, for some reason, the, the formatting of the, of the tape, a lot of the tables are messed up, but um, I apologize for that. But um, here is kind of the main set of results on, on the OLS and the IV. So we see that in, yeah, so yeah, so a lot of the, yeah, I'm sorry, apologize for the formatting of the table. So essentially if you focus on panel B, where we have the IV results, we see that essentially if you move 100 kilometers away from a nearest gauge break, that results in, that results in kind of a 30% a decrease in population in our, in our most, in our most, uh, saturated specification with all the controls. Here, each column of the, of the, of the regression table corresponds to a version of the regression with different level of controls. In the first column, we include just a polynomial in the latitude and longitude as well as a log area of the county. And when we move, from, when we move to the second column, we include stated fixed effects. And in the third column, we include the kind of the railroad variables that I mentioned before, that whether the county has railroads as well as a number of railroad companies. In the fourth column, we include distance to different geographic features I mentioned before. In the, five, in the fifth and sixth column, we include, we include uh, controls for lag population growth as well as pre-railroad productivity. And we also show our result is kind of robust to exclusion of different, different sample. So if we restrict our sample to only counties that had positive population in 1850, so if we're now looking at newly settled areas by 1860, our results are robust. And if we, if we exclude kind of um, states that contain major cities you think might be driving the results, such as Chicago, Boston, or New York, our results are still robust. So I think, so I think the, um, the question you might still have is that just locations that have kind of gauge breaks might, uh, might look different prior to the introduction of gauge breaks. So to, to, kind of, to kind of assess whether this is true, we're gonna estimate a difference in different specification, where essentially we'll look at kind of 
uh, the pattern of, of population growth in gauge break and non-gauge break counties prior to, the, to their plausible introduction to see whether the trends are essentially parallel. And if they are, we could be reasonably think, you know, these places look essentially the same before gauge breaks were introduced. And any differences after the introduction of gauge break could be, uh, could be um, attributed to the, causally to the introduction of gauge break. Thank you. So, and, and to put that in, into, put that into kind of mathematical equations, that would be the, essentially the reg regression specification. And here we plot the results in two ways. In the first, in the first graph, we show the dotted line is the population is the population growth essentially in, in counties with gauge break, and the the solid line is the population growth in counties without gauge break. And we see that prior to 1860, they are, they essentially lie on top of each other. So before kind of um, the introduction of railroads and introduction of gauge breaks, these counties don't look very different. And the difference between these two lines essentially is plotted on the second graph where we see they only become significantly positive after 1860. And an interesting, interesting observation is that even after the standardization of gauge breaks in 1880 and 1886, these locations continue to be, continue to be um, much more populous. And the reason for that, we think, is that just there's tends to be a kind of persistence and agglomeration. And this is something we're gonna be addressed we're gonna kind of deal with and we're gonna, we're gonna quantify in our, in our structural model. So here is just kind of a, a regression specification that shows that kind of persistence results. Even if we look at kind of population in 2000, we still see that locations that had gauge breaks before were more, or have 20% have higher population than their kind of neighboring counties accounting for all the obs other observable differences. Yeah, I don't, um, yeah, the, the slides are really misformatted. I apologize. Um, so in our structural analysis, we're gonna introduce this, um, so, so what does this tell us? This doesn't really tell us anything, I think it's economic interesting because we're just, um, we're, we're seeing the locations that require more labor have more people. So in the next, in the second half of the paper, the question we try to address is what is the welfare implication? And you can't, really, you can't really kind of answer questions about welfare without a specific model in mind, so we're gonna use the workforce model, model in trade theory, which is the Armington model. It has, it has a very kind of a specific welfare term, uh, has a very, it has an, ex an explicit welfare term, and it's kind, of, um, it's kind of the most basic trade model you could write down. And our contribution theoretically is that we're gonna be introducing an entrepot sector into the, into the Armington model. So essentially, if you wanna ship through certain locations, you must pay those locations um, kind of uh, dollar amounts that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's proportional to, you, to the amount that you're trying to ship. So you could think of this as kind of a, as a system of bilateral tariffs where the, the amount of tariff you're paying on any given route depends on, on, on the locations you're passing through on that route and whether those locations are gauge breaks or not. So this essentially endogenizes the trade costs faced by any given location and significantly kind of complicates the problem. But in some sense, we think this is a kind of a more, more accurate kind of a depiction of, of economic geography because you know, traditionally, we just have these iceberg trade costs where, where goods are literally melting as they go along, but obviously that's not how, how shipping and transportation works. Um, yeah, so here is just kind of a, a simple summary of the model. And, um, and yeah, it's, we're completely working in a static setting. And some of the other kind of novelties we're introducing in the model is that we're, we introduce a framework that allows us, allows us to, cal uh, to calculate the elasticity of routes to changes within them, to changes to, to the cost of any given segment in a very kind of a, in a very kind of simple, uh, in a very kind of, um, parsimonious manner. And this lets us do kind of a welfare analysis to derive any kind of analytical expressions for welfare in a way that people, that you weren't, people weren't able to do before. And to kind of incorporate these, uh, this model kind of uh, quantitatively, we build a very kind of a robust transportation network of the United States, which includes not just the railroads, but also kind of canals and other alternatives to railroads, such as wagon routes and, um, and, and waterways and lakes. And this, this, will be, this is something that we utilize in the, in the structural analysis. I think I'll just 
quickly summarize. So, so, so I'm not gonna really present the structural aspects of the paper today, even though it's actually a major part of the project, but um, because it's kind of still a work in progress and, um, and subject to change. So essentially in the future, we, we hope to kind of, um, in, the, in the future we hope to kind of understand what would be the count, counterfactual population distribution in the United States that would be in absence of these uh, railroad gauge breaks, and we hope to kind of derive conditions under which the um, population, uh, under which welfare is either decreasing or increasing in the existence of, of entrepots. And that's pretty much the project. Thank you. Uh, thank you for an interesting paper, Northwestern uh, colleague. Thank you. Uh, I would point you to two sources that I didn't see in your brief bibliography there. Um, one is Cronin's Nature's Met Metropolis, um, an excellent oh, book yeah. about Chicago yeah. and how it developed uh, and makes a lot of the same points you're making, I think. And then the other one is James Vance, which is uh, North American Railroads, its origins, geography, et cetera. Let me just grab a pen real quick. Um, the Vance book really talks an awful lot about entrepo, and the plural of that is entrepo, I think. <laughs> I think you're probably right. Yeah. <laughs> <Nespa? laughs> um, so anyway, those two I would really direct to. Uh, or suggest that you check out. Uh, the, the point about centrality on um, distance between two entrepôts uh, is really important to another set of factors that also, I think, have huge significance in the uh, point that you're reaching for. One is the state capital, which developed often because it was at that point of centrality. In fact, in my work, uh, the state capital seems to be the single, the single most important uh, d d um, driver, uh, determinant um, reason for a state capital being chosen to be the state capital is hmm. its centrality. Uh, and they also tended to congregate at the same points as the entrepot, uh, places like the fall line. And that leads finally to the point about not just gauge change, which is a factor, I think, but also modal change, which in the early days of transportation networks was often um, a, a result of the geography of navigable waterways, uh, in contrast to non-navigable routes. So if you look at lake ports, river crossings, take a place like Philadelphia where you, the early railroads stopped on the New Jersey side and you had to get over to the Pennsylvania side with a break in the mode, namely a waterway ferry. And that seems to me equally more significant than a gauge change. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you for your comments. Uh, Rob Fisher from FTI Consulting. Um, have you looked at, uh, I think I remember reading about the north versus the south and the, the gauge changes uh, were more, at least on a percentage basis, more preponderant in the south. Did you come across that? Uh, you know, back in like 1860. Um, and secondly, do you have any kind of uh, perfect examples that you've come across where a, a small town otherwise wouldn't have thrived at all without one of these gate changes? Uh, for your first point, um, yeah, I think relative, so there were more, to, 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 there were just like more miles of railroads in the north compared to the south. So I think like if you normalize by the miles of tracks, it is true there's more gauge changes in the south, but I think, um, I, th I think without normalization, there were probably actually more gauges in the north, more gauge differences in the north, but that's probably just due to like a, 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 higher, dense, a higher density network. Uh, 
Uh, as far as your, for your second point, um, I think the I think the area example is actually quite good in that it's like kind of a it's kind of a railroad town in some ways. It's like a, it's a town we associate with with kind of the Erie Railroad that was that was very prominent in the early 1840 and 1850, and and yeah, like in the in narrative history of the town, in the anecdotal history of the town, they really emphasize the the importance of the gauge break in its early kind of uh, importance to in the, kind of uh, on on a national level. Yeah, so I didn't mention this in the in the in the talk, but uh, we also actually just do a lot of our analysis at the town level, where we identify railroad towns and we see whether the railroad town contained a gauge break or not, and we kind of look at population growth from 1850 and 1860, and we see that the the, the growth tend to be much more extreme in towns that were were that that in towns that contained a, a gauge break. So so much much more smaller scale than looking at the county that encloses the towns. But um, but you're right. I could definitely do more research and have more kind of a narrative examples that illustrates the point. Yeah, uh, this is this is David Basenko from uh, the Kellogg School at Northwestern. Uh, hey, you. First of all, great job on the on the presentation, and uh, it seems like incredibly interesting research. One thing that interests me is uh, the fact that you actually have different gauges at all, and I would think of that particularly in periods where the rail system is rapidly developing. I would think of that as reflecting um, a fairly significant coordination failure. Uh, and it makes me wonder whether if one were to think about the conditions under which a coordination failure would occur, would we expect those conditions to differ systematically by geographic location? Uh, and so were there places, were there cities or towns where we might expect this coordination to break down more for whatever reason, for reasons of population, uh, or the presence of other modes or, or, or other things. Have you thought about kind of the, the um, in a sense, the kind of the game theory of why uh, you might end up with different gauges in the, in the first place and whether that would inform the kind of uh, inquiry that you're doing? No, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, I, think, I think it might be uh, to, uh, I understand your point about coordination failure, but in some ways you have to kind of understand the objective of the early railroad builders. It wasn't really, there was no sense you want to kind of uh, like maximize trade between Chicago or Boston, for example. It was really kind of Chicago wanted to bring raw goods from the rest of the Cook County or like Illinois area. So building railroads was really kind of a local endeavor that, that you didn't really need to think about coordinating with somebody kind of half the country away. At most, you were thinking about coordination with your immediate neighbors, if that. So, so yeah, it results in coordination failure, but, um, but I guess given the objectives of the railroad builders at the time, it's hard to think I guess in some ways they were myopic, but um, but um, yeah, it's, it's a really good point about kind of studying that mechanisms more directly. Hi, Lori Wiegler. I'm not an economist. I'm a journalist with Transport Topics. I find the idea of pistols being drawn because they don't want to fix the gauge breaks. <laughs> to, I'm wondering if there are any other ramifications you've studied with, that are counterintuitive like that if, for the rail industry if, over any period of time where things weren't getting uh, fixed or uh, working together as fast as they should because of the economic drawbacks to segments of the community. Right. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are, there are other examples too. Um, I can't, um, I, guess, I guess I don't have other kind of great examples off, off the top of my head, but I think, the, I think it kind of illustrates the point that, you know, there's like agents of, with different incentives and for the local population, it doesn't really matter how efficient the railroad, the railroad, uh, I guess, uh, shipments are for the railroad companies. It really matters what hap what's happening locally, and that leads to kind of a conflict of uh, a conflict of interest. That's like very viscerally illustrated with the with the arm conflict. Yeah. I actually can give you a modern gauge break. Has anyone driven to Breezewood, Pennsylvania lately, <laughs> where you can't get on the Pennsylvania Turnpike seamlessly from Washington D.C. Um, uh, Ferdinando Monte, Georgetown. Um, so, uh, so there's something you keep, you kept saying in the in the in the paper, which is the benefit of the of the of the gauge break. Uh, obviously, there's a cost right. for the guys that are around the gauge yep. break, right? So, uh, I was wondering whether you, as a as a, as an additional source of model validation, you could. Uh, um, so you treat these gauge breaks basically as a tariff. And uh, you could check whether the way the company is merged is consistent with a sort of uh, surplus maximizations around 
the um, around the areas where these companies were operating, right? Because if, if if it's a, if a, if the gauge break is a tariff, when you remove it, it's like the removal of a tariff, and this is going to have distributional consequences among the different places, and you can check whether that's consistent with what we would expect about sort of optimal tariffs. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. We haven't done that. Hi, Kevin Neal from the Brattle Group. I um, was very interesting analysis. I just wanted to get a little bit of a better understanding about the instrumental variables you were using. Sure. As I understand it, you were looking at the distance of a county from the midpoint of a line segment connecting the centers of two networks. Is that right? That's fair. Yeah. Uh, so two-part question then. One is, um, how did you define a network for purposes of determining a centroid? And given that there are many possible combinations of network, Networks, which pair of networks did you, how did you select two networks sure. to identify a midpoint to use as an instrument for a particular county? That's, those are really good points, really great, really great questions. Um, with, with identifying the network, we look, we, we were able to kind of load the 1840 kind of railroad network into, into ArcGIS software, and, and from there you're able to kind of look at, so we, we will like, um, I guess like select um, an area where like where within which there was like a, a like a kind of a separate railroad network and from there we just kind of pick the midpoint of that of that it would be like it would be like the uh, the smallest circle that enclosed um, a given segment of railroads that were connected together so it's based on physical connections rather than ownership based on physical physical connections rather than ownership you're right okay yeah. And, um, and as far as uh, your point about the combination, we, so so I think this might not have been clear. Uh, we actually drew lines between any 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 two points there, any two kind of network centroids that were of the different gauge breaks. And we 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 so there's there's more than just one midpoint. There's a, yes. there's many different midpoints, and we just find the distance to the closest midpoint as, a, as an instrument. Okay, so that it could be. Um, so just to think through the implications of that, you sure. could have two networks that were very close to the county, but their line segment, the mid, their midpoint could be further from the county than two networks that were much more distant. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah okay. that's a fair point. Just, yeah. All right, just, just trying to get my mind around it. Thank sure. you very much, that's no, very you. helpful. Uh, I, just to add to uh, your answer to David's question, um, if we're looking back at the history, uh, one thing also to keep in mind is that different gauges actually had different cost characteristics and were actually not built randomly, but were built for particular purposes. So this is especially apparent if you look internationally, where in India, for example, in mountainous regions, you built much narrower gauge yep. railways yep. because it was much, it was twice as expensive to try yep. to dig into the mountain twice as much. The wider gauges, more stable, yep. all, all kinds of things like that. So it wasn't just accidental random. There were cost reasons and commodity reasons and geographic reasons for building those different gauges in the first place. I think that's true near a lot of the Rocky Mountains, where there were a lot of narrow gauges being used. But actually, in the in the 1860s, when we look at kind of railroads mostly existed kind of, I guess east mostly east of the Mississippi, there, the, the difference you're looking at isn't consequential for, from an engineering perspective. Like, there's no sense that like, a four feet, six inches would be like less, would be better suited for some regions than the four feet, eight inches. There, we, we're looking at differences that are, I don't think are that engineering, uh, like that um, important for engineering purposes, okay. but your point is well taken. Okay. For example, in the Rocky Mountains, all the railroads were on narrow gauge because mm -hmm. you needed it for, for, the, for the terrain. And just one point to answer, uh, to answer, go back to Lori's question, if we're, if we're looking for interesting anecdotes, I suppose it's a historical question that will never be answered, but as you know, I'm sure the Russian Empire built wider gauge track than the rest of Europe. And it has always been rumored, but never, I think we'll never know, whether Nicholas I did that on purpose as a military defensive mechanism. Correct. Um, or whether it was for other reasons. Yep. But that's always been a rumor that he did that to discourage invasion by the, by the evil uh, Western Europeans who could just take their troops in on, the, on their gauge railroads. Let's put a gauge break. Um, Nate Vomisil, FRA. Actually, just to add to that, my point was uh, the um, gauge standardization in Europe occurred at a much, much later date because of political reasons than it did in the United States. So that could actually... Um, give further credence to the to the idea that it was the engine boats themselves providing the causality and, and not the political power because there wouldn't be any uh, reason to put, you know, those 
sit those places along borders. It's true. Yeah, I think I think even in Europe today, there's still tracks of different gauges. Like that is, yeah, yeah, Portugal. yeah, between yeah. Spain, Portugal, and Spain and France, I think. Yeah. Uh, John Mayo, Georgetown. Uh, just a quick question. It sounds like you're headed toward a welfare analysis of this, and it struck me uh, as interesting because most of the time people think about standardization as increasing economic welfare. Here what you had is a situation where different gauges increased economic activity at particular points in time or, or in space, but arguably wouldn't that be welfare decreasing relative to the counterfactual that the gauges would be the same and economic activity would have occurred elsewhere? Yes. And I'm just curious if you plan to build that into the analysis. We do have that analysis. In our, in our analysis, when like an entrepot exists, essentially the trade costs along the route, along all the routes that go through increase, but that location is, 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 uh, is getting a direct subsidy essentially from locations that are shipping through it. But in, in just a vanilla version of the model, we do have a kind of an, a welfare decrease. It's just not as bad as you expect from, from increasing trade costs uh, without accounting for the subsidies. But um, so currently we're working on versions of the model where there's agglomeration forces and we, we essentially the intuition we get is that, you know, if there's agglomeration, it might be, it might be better for a lot of industries to be essentially located in the same, in the same location than there. That is like kind of, a, I think Krugman's like footloose argument, then, then that could maybe lead to some welfare increase. But, uh, but in the very vanilla version of the model, you're, you're absolutely correct. It's, it leads to a, a welfare decrease, despite the fact these locations are better off. All right, thank you.